Okay, well, good evening, everybody. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm here for EdChat Interactive. And let me just share my screen a little bit. So EdChat Interactive, what we try to do is to find really interesting things that are going on in education and allow the people who are doing them to share them so that other educators can benefit. And tonight, we're talking about the Conrad Challenge. The, the Conrad Challenge is a, uh, it's, it's a contest where students uh, um, develop uh, sustainable businesses uh, to solve problems using STEM. And then the Conrad Challenge mentors them and helps them through that process. And uh, the person who's going to be leading the discussion is Christy Bates Letter. And you can see her um, description right, right here. And Christy has brought a number of students who have been through the challenge to also present about their experiences. So this should be really interesting. Uh, we do have two other sessions coming up this fall on October 25th. Um, those of you who know Lisa Paresi uh, knows that she's been an educator for 35 years. And her talk, her discussion is gonna be about how she spent 35 years teaching kids how to respect each other, even if they dislike each other. And then um, on November 17th, we're gonna have uh, John Chimbari, who's been a teacher, a principal, and a professional developer. who's gonna be talking about sexy assessment. Uh, this assessment doesn't have to be demotivating and boring the way uh, a lot of us do it now. But with that said, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand the reins over to Christy and thank you for coming. And where are you coming from, Christy? So I am in Lafayette, Colorado, um, and I'm a teacher from Peak to Peak Charter School out here. How uh, do you have any of the wildfire, wildf wildfires? I have um, a lot of relatives who are in the steamboat area, and you know they've been saying that they you know they can't see their days. How do you have the wildfire virus where you are? So we definitely have. We don't have the fires super encroaching as they do in steamboat, but boy, do we get the smoke, um, and it sneaks up on you. You're out for a walk and. You know, you're, you're, it's a beautiful Colorado day. We have these um, famously blue skies. And then all of a sudden, you feel like you're standing in the middle of a campfire. It gets really sort of thick and soupy super fast. So it has been a quite, quite the season with the fires and the smoke. Wow. Um, so anyhow, why don't you, uh, why don't you start leading, leading the discussion about, uh, about the Conrad Challenge? And I'm going to mute myself and I'll stop my own video. All right. Well, thank you so much for having us. I think it's uh, absolutely an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, and I especially appreciate that you're allowing students to take the reins because I think nothing really expresses the Conrad challenge like the idea that the students are in charge, right? Because the, the Conrad challenge, it's an opportunity for students. It's a competition. Um, it's social entrepreneurship, but really what it does is it asks students, uh, you know, in a number of categories to solve the world's problems and not in some, you know, just hypothetical kind of way, but to actually generate solutions. Um, and the students who are here today generated wildly creative solutions and they did so much work and so much research. Um, and what the Conrad Challenge asks of them, and it's, it's pretty important as an educator uh, to see this in action and to see what my students have done is, you know, to take something that doesn't have an easy answer and for them to be willing to fail and to try and to solve something that, uh, you know, us grownups haven't really gotten a handle on yet and haven't figured out how to solve. And so, the so you, you probably don't know this, but I'm a boomer. Okay, so <laughs> we got to cause all these problems. And so that, you know, we just wanted to do that to give you, you know, you kids a chance to solve real problems. That's the only reason why we created this whole mess. You realize that, right? I'm just waiting for one of them to give you the response that I know they're dying to give you. Um. <laughs> and, and you you guys feel free to give whatever response you think you want. I, I can take it. Yeah. I, have, I have kids too. Okay, well, 
they, they're not saying, oh, okay, boomer, but they're all thinking it right now, you can see on their faces. Um, <laughs> but yeah, what, what's amazing to me and, and what's amazing as an instructor with this process where they pitched ideas, they wrote full business plans, they researched finance, um, they made prototypes. I mean, the things that they did were absolutely amazing. They stood up on stage at the Kennedy Space Center and presented to luminaries from NASA. I mean, it really was incredible. And one of the things I will say as an instructor, and this is the reason the students are here, is it really is about their ideas and their solutions. And I did not know the solutions that they came up with. I, I learned from them. Um, and I know a lot more about tobacco now than I ever did before. <laughs> um, I know, you know, there's, there's so many things that I learn along the way because my students teach them to me as they find out and they problem solve. Um, the Conrad Challenge is an opportunity, one of the things that's so special about it, to empower students and to hear their voices. Um, so that to me is what makes it so special um, that they really know their voices matter um, and that they can change the world and they don't have to wait until they're my age, which I'm not going to share, but it's only slightly below boomer. Um, you know, they don't have to wait. They can start changing the world now. Um, and you know, the, the students who are here right now, they really have indeed done that. So it's pretty incredible. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and share with you what it is that really for them um, was so important about the Conrad Challenge and about their process. Because I think that as educators to hear from students what they learn from something and how their motivation works and to hear from students what pushed them to put in, oh gosh, so many hours and so much thought and creativity. I think that that's really the thing that is most impressive to me and, and can be most educational to educators out there as well as just, of course, anybody curious. So, um, Jeffrey, you were the one who was going to share your screen and show us just the Conrad Challenge website. They have a lot of resources there and they introduce you to what the challenge is. So just so you know, Jeffrey is also, he started a business and innovation club um, at our school. He, he lives and breathes this stuff. So also he's really, really good with technology. So this is another reason I like to turn things over to him. So Jeffrey, would you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the Conrad Challenge? Um, yes, I would love to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I will pull up the website right now. And uh, yeah, so I did the Conrad Challenge in 2019 and 2020. And I'm also doing it this year. Uh, 2019, I uh, I joined a team with uh, Izzy, yeah. <laughs> so uh, basically, uh, Conrad Challenge is where uh, students can form teams and they come together to solve like global issues basically. And if I go to the challenge, you can see uh, these year's issues, if I find the categories, uh, we have things ranging from like aerospace, technology, uh, energy, there's also health. And uh, what the category that I entered in was the smoke free world uh, for Malawi. Uh, basically, I had to find a solution to repurpose uh, the tobacco coming out of Malawi to create a basically sustainable um, economy and also like uh, find a way to use tobacco for good. So uh, Izzy and I, plus, plus two others, we came up with the idea of uh, 
using tobacco to create uh, tobacco bandages. Uh, she, she could probably speak a lot more on this topic than I can, but <laughs> yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Uh, the, this is amazing when you think about something that is as harmful and has caused as many health problems as tobacco has. This project, right, and you should tell them that your, your team name um, was just so incredible in terms of how it turned that completely on its head. Yeah, I'd love to. I, um, I'll try to keep this short because um, I could talk, like Jeffrey said, a lot about this, but <laughs> we basically innovated an idea of taking the tobacco leaves um, and turning them into bandages, but also on top of this, creating a 15-year uh, transition plan from tobacco farms to Euphorbia Gardens, which is a native plant in Malawi that is used for respiratory issues. So you think about, you know, we had this physical impact, but also a symbolic impact from moving from something that hurts you to something that helps you. So our name was Malawi Hurt to Health, um, which I think we were pretty proud of. Um, it's a pretty so great yeah, name. Keeping it short and sweet. Um, yeah. Just, I'm just curious, did you find that the farmers can earn enough, as much money from growing the healthful product as they were able to earn in tobacco? Yeah, so they actually made, I don't remember uh, the exact amount because it's been over oh, yeah. almost two years now, but they made a lot more using the euphorbia plants over the tobacco plants. Uh, That's fantastic. Yeah. And it's interesting too, I just wanna say, it was so fascinating when they did this research because of course, you know, we are, we know that um, smoking damages lungs, that there are problems, but then to find out that there are health benefits and also that, you know, in shifting away from cigarettes or, and the, the smoking of tobacco, that there's an issue with tobacco farms and with the small farmers, right? And that was really where um, so much of the impact could be could be noted. And so that was a pretty yeah, spectacular. And I, think, I think so few of us think of forget how dangerous tobacco can be, and that it actually kills some of the farmers because of how um, toxic it is to work with. So when we were handling the tobacco leaves, we had to be extremely careful. Um, because we didn't want to harm ourselves or anything like that. Yeah, we, we were actually able to get our hands on uh, dried tobacco leaves and <laughs> we uh, did some experiments at our uh, school laboratory. So that was very interesting. Like yeah. the, the Conrad Challenge really allows students to uh, get hands-on experience if they really want to go into prototyping or like implementing their concept. Yeah. So you then maybe took your friends and had them handle the leaves with gloves and the people you didn't like handled the leaves without gloves? Is that, is that how you conducted your experiment? Exactly. Oh, totally. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's interesting too. And I know that, um, but the other students who are here today, they both did they we they were very interested in this category as well and i wanted to show you the range even when the prompt is very similar their projects um took a different angle on you know how to solve for so many of the issues that have to do with tobacco production and use of tobacco and tobacco farms and um, the rolling of BDs and the, you know, so many different, um, in using empathy here, there's so many different people that are affected um, by it. So can we just have our other participants, our students just say hello and talk a little bit. Um, the other two here both did similar but different projects to, so that you can see the range of even within a similar question, how these students innovated and really came up with solutions um, that were wildly impressive. 
Um, I can go next. My name is Mona. Um, I'm a senior at Peak to Peak this year. And so the category we did was also Smoke Free World, but our subcategory was BD Smoking in India. Um, and so basically what we innovated was flavored toothpicks that used um, culturally appropriate and abundant spices that were proven to help combat with nicotine addiction because BDs, if I remember, correctly have three to five times more nicotine than normal cigarettes. So they're very, very addictive. Um, and we needed something that would be cheap enough to be competitive in the market. And so we found a bunch of super abundant, super cheap spices that activated the brain the same way nicotine does. So it can actually help a person um, move away from smoking. Um, and so we did that. And then we also wanted to make sure that we were accounting for the women and children whose livelihoods depended on rolling BDs. And so our plan involved having the women work in our factory while we educated them about business. Um, and then we would let them take out microloans to start their own businesses. And if they didn't wanna do that, they could have advancement opportunities and leadership opportunities. And then we also had a plan to send all the children to school so that they could get their education. Um, and just to go back to what Miss Letter was saying about empathy, I think like that's what really drew me to the Conrad challenge because just the way that they present the idea, like they present the challenges and like the ideas by telling you about all like the problems and the people behind them. And like you really feel a connection and that's like what makes you wanna solve the problem is just like that connection you feel to a topic. And that was just really what drew me to that category. So I had never even heard of the term BD before you brought it up. And so I just looked it up and are BD smoked outside of India also? Are they, I've never seen them in the U S. Um, so they're mostly smoked in India. Like that's where the biggest market is. They are smoked in other countries as well. I don't think we have them in the U S they're like herbal cigarettes. Um, and they're like really, really abundant in India. Like that's probably, I think the main, one of the main tobacco products that they smoke in India. And do people find them more pleasurable than cigarettes or are they just more, are they more addicting or why um, are they popular? Um, from the research we did, it was first of all, the addiction factor. Like we said, like I said, they have, I think three to five times more nicotine than normal cigarettes. Um, and also they're insanely cheap. Like you can get a pack, like a huge pack of, I don't know how many for less than a dollar. Obviously that's American currency and you have to convert that, but they're very, very, very cheap. And so they're easily accessible and extremely addictive. So people who would just use them a few times and you know they bought them because they're cheap one time would kind of get hooked and it would just kind of cause them to, to keep smoking and keep buying. So just what was the path then that took you from deciding, oh, you know, I'm a kid in high school to, you know, something, I'm going to do something that's going to solve this BD problem that um, we're having with health in India. What, how did you get there? Yeah, so, um, well, my family and I travel a lot. And so I had actually been to India and I, I had seen the smoking there. And so that had kind of just been in the back of my mind. And then when Miss Letter presented the Conrad challenge to us and she presented all the categories, this one just really kind of struck me just because I, I had seen it. And like I said, the way they present the problem is like, they're like, these are the people being affected by it. And I remember Miss Letter was standing in front of our class and she was like, these are the women and children who are being like affected by this and impacted by this. And not only do you have to help the people who are addicted, but you have to help these women and children as well. And so that was kind of what hooked us in. And then from there, it was just like, how can we find an idea that's simple enough that it would work? And so, you know, we did some, we talked to Miss Letter and we were like, what's something that we could, we found these spices and we were like, how are we gonna put these together? Like, we can't just like make, make food or something. And, we started thinking about flavored toothpicks and how people always just like gnaw on like toothpicks and flavored toothpicks and how that was a big, big craze and how they're really cheap. And so it just all kind of came together after a, a long process of researching and asking questions and collaborating, but it just, that's how it came together. How did you find out about those spices? That um, Yeah, so we kind of, 
Okay, as part of our research process, we didn't really know what we were doing when we first started. Um, and so we just started searching like um, things that help with nicotine addiction. And, you know, at some point we scrolled so far that we hit spices and there's was, there was this random spice and they were like, this helps. And so we were like, oh, that's interesting because obviously Indian culture and Indian cuisine has, has a lot of spices. And we were like, is there a way that we can incorporate that and use their their culture to make sure that this is like a product that would work and so we did a lot of research and we found out that cayenne pepper actually was one of our main ingredients and when you eat cayenne pepper because it's spicy it lights up the exact same part of the brain that nicotine lights up and nicotine when it lights up that part of the brain that's what gets you addictive because it's releasing like endorphins in in your brain and making you like happy and positive um, and so cayenne pepper actually does the same thing in your brain and they've done plenty of studies on this. Um, and so we did more and more research on, on the spice and we are like, oh, well, if this works and people have done research on this, we could use this. And so then we started looking at other spices. So we came up with like a variety of like three to five spices with cayenne pepper being our main one that like when paired together would really get to the root cause of like all the different parts of tobacco addiction. And you know, you I don't want to monopolize you because there's other there's other students here also. Are there other kids from your group who are here tonight? Or is no so I, I had two other group members, but they're not here tonight. So how did you form your group? So <laughs> Miss Letter has this process. Um so we were in the innovation class and I don't think I ever worked with a single person twice, and I worked with everyone in that class. So every project, Miss Letter would put you in a new group with new people. And the first time you got into your group, she'd be like, okay, icebreakers, introduce yourself, get to know each other. You're solving the world's problems and you're gonna change the world. Um, and so she just kind of threw us into groups and it was it was great. We collaborated with everyone and she just kind of, you know, it was really Miss Letter. We owe it all to her. She really was the one who came up with the groups and and how to make us all collaborate and work together and and just you know change the world so and yeah it was a little it? they got they definitely got annoyed with it but yeah. i will say as an instructor that replicating the real world where you know it they've they've proven again and again heterogeneous groupings are more innovative um but the tendency is, of course, in a classroom, when there's a small group, you're like, well, I just want to work with my friends. I want to work with people who I know and like the same things as me. And um, there was definitely a lot of pushback to the whole like, oh, no, not another totally random group. Um, but I do think that getting together minds and, you know, people that just simply were different, um, that that really does spark that sparks a lot of possibility uh, and it allows people to build collaboration skills that, you know, us adults and really do know is super valuable later in life. So uh, as adults, we don't collaborate, we fight. <laughs> so, so, so what's this stuff about collaboration? No, no, but, but, you know, in the groups, you must have had times where they, where you disagreed. How did you learn in the group to get past that? And what did you find did you learn things from when you disagreed with other people in the group? Yeah, I mean, I think that was part of the beauty of the class was not only we're trying to solve like these huge world problems, but you're trying to solve like the little problems of the fights in your group and when people didn't agree with each other. And you um, are, Ma you're, how do you pronounce your name? Mana? Mana. Yeah. So, and um, I just wanted to make sure that you got your name out. So uh thank you for thank you for volunteering for, um so go ahead um learning how to uh, i guess collaborate or argue with people in the groups and get past that go ahead wow. yeah so i think it was just more like you would you'd be in your group and you'd have a disagreement and then you just have to kind of learn how to get through it you'd have to think okay why do you think that and then they'd be like well why do you think that and you just you would go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until you compromised and you came up with with an idea also miss letter gave us really tight timelines so it was in your best interest to like get over that problem as quick as you could because you had a deadline coming up in 15 minutes and you knew that if you spent 15 minutes arguing you would not meet it 
So it was just kind of everything put together. You were like, okay, we need to figure this out. You, like, you don't agree with me. I don't agree with you. What are we going to do? How are we going to compromise and, and figure this out? Now, how do you get um, a group to be creative? Because there's a there's this expression that, a, you know, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. So when you have a group of people, how do you come up with some things that are really valuable rather than just things that are compromises that nobody objects, nobody objects to? Um, I think for us, it was a lot of dividing and conquering and finding our strengths. So we were like, okay, your, you know, your strength is really research. So how about you go and research and do that and report back? And your strength is really writing. So how about you go and write and, and come up with this idea and come back? And your strength is really like communicating and reaching out to people and networking. So how about you go like find some people who can give us feedback and come back? And so it was a lot of like everyone doing what they were good at. And then bringing that to the table to kind mm -hmm. of create like a cohesive, a cohesive group and a cohesive idea that kind of had every single component the best that it could be. And to a large extent, it sounds like it was self-organized. You're the ones who figured out, you know, what had to be done, who could do it, and when there was a problem, how to come to an agreement, right? Yeah. And that's probably something that's going to help you the rest of your lives. Right. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Like a lot of life skills. And then um, one of the things I think in, in the Conrad challenge is that you have access to mentors, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what types of things, maybe somebody else, what are some of the, some of the things that where you work with mentors? Um, yeah, I can speak on that. Okay. And your name is? <laughs> Um, my name is Paul Pasha. I'm a junior at Peak to Peak, and I participated in the Conrad Challenge um, this year. And so um, going back to the question, I really, the, the mentorship that Conrad Challenge provides is honestly really, really helpful, especially for me because everything was moved online because of COVID restrictions this year. Having um, like mentorship from the actual committee and from the actual challenge was something that really helped our team. A lot of it is primarily just helping on um, really formulating your product and helping design it to its fullest extent. Also, um, you know, writing a business plan is one of the like fundamental concepts that you have to know to participate in the challenge. And the Conrad Challenge provided workshops on that. Um, it was just a lot of focus on teamwork and um, working together to create a cohesive plan. And they were all really, really helpful mentorship sessions. Yeah. So if I wanted to start a business, what would you tell me about starting a business, about writing my business plan? Well, I think starting a business first begins with um, having a cohesive framework for that business. And well, then to I'm, start a business, you need to be on the same <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, a business has many aspects, but <laughs> teamwork is the primary thing mm -hmm. that you need to work on. And, and, and then the and, business plan itself, what goes into a business plan? Oh, uh, yeah. A business plan is just an amalgamation of a lot of things, but the primary aspects that a business plan typically contains is um, just having like like explanations on what your product is, how you're going to be implementing it and how you're going to be actually funding it and actually making it into reality. Um, it's just a lot of background info on the framework of what your product is going to be and how it'll work and just how your business is going to function and how it's projected to help people in the future. And you got that from working in the con as part of the Conrad Challenge. That's pretty amazing. It is. I also, I want to jump in because uh, you have to hear the story. Um, and I'm sorry, but you, I, I have to tell you this. So not only did Paul Pasha have to, you know, do all of the work that, that all of these other amazing students did to create a business plan, to collaborate with, you know, the, the random grouping that she was in. But then, of course, with COVID um, and safety at the forefront, it, the Conrad Challenge had to pivot and immediately put everything online. And I don't know how they did it, but it was pretty impressive. Um, but one of the moments in which problem solving went to the nth dimension 
um, was in the middle of, you know, I'm going to let you tell the story, but in the middle of the most high stakes presentation of all, uh, there was a tech failure. Uh, and Palpasha, I'm going to let you tell that story, but please think about <laughs> what kind of problem skills uh, she had to, you know, draw on at this moment, because I was watching and just, it was so incredible. Um, and I was, of course, so anxiety ridden, like, oh, no, I don't think they'll ever pull out of this. And I don't mean to spoil anything, but they did. But I'm going to let her tell that story. So yeah, as this letter said, um, there were a lot of technical difficulties because of the online format of the Conrad Challenge this year. For our team, because of it being online, it was heavily focused on presentation and just having a, like, a great presentation and a great plan with your teammates. And well, we had that set up and we'd had assigned roles for all of our teammates, me and two others. And so we had specific aspects of the business plan we were going to be talking about since we all focused on different um, parts of it. And we had a team leader that was going to direct all the questions towards the um, team members when we were and, asked. And I'm questions. sorry to interrupt, but what was, but your, what was your product? We got up what, what was your what Oh, were yeah, yeah. Yeah, so our product was something called tobacco. Basically, we were in the same smoke-free category as everyone else, but we were primarily focused on alleviating the impacts of tobacco production on Malawi farmers. And so how we were going to do that is by creating alternate use for tobacco. And so the tobacco plant has a lot of protein. It actually has more protein than a single serving of black beans which is the most protein dense food in, on earth, which is kind of crazy because I never even knew about that. Um, but our product was going to take that protein from the tobacco leaf and actually create protein powder out of it so that we could put it into different food packages such as oatmeal and um, protein bars and provide that to low income areas in Malawi and other parts of the world. Wow. Okay, so back to the tech problems. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> so you, you were about to make your presentation, right? Mm -hmm. So we were about to make our presentation and our team leader was actually going to direct all questions towards um, me and my other teammate, but we ran into some tech difficulties with our team leader. And so during the presentation, his mic wasn't working. And um, <laughs> so he could not speak in front of any of the teammates or of in the committee. And we had to work around that because he was going to be the one directing the questions. And me and my, my other teammate hadn't planned on, um, you know, focusing in on answering any of his parts of the business plan. We had to improvise and begin to cover all of it while simultaneously helping our other teammate try to get his mic back to work. Wow. <laughs> So, um, so in the cases where he was going to be answering a, a particular type of question, you, one of you had to fill in then, right? Yeah, and it was somewhat difficult just because we hadn't prepared that um, section of our business plan and we hadn't prepped ourselves to answer those questions. Um, but we did have to improvise and thankfully, as Miss Letter said, it did go well, but it did teach us a lot about just being innovative in the moment and not just innovative with your um, thought process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was pretty, I just have to say as, as a witness, um, it was pretty impressive because not only was Lyric, her team member, you know, responsible for certain parts which he spoke to more fluently because they were just his, you know, the, the things that he had concentrated on, but also he was the person who was, because it was his specialty, you know, directing the questions and sort of leading the presentation. So it was really like right at the key moment, the person who was in charge and the leader just completely was standing there mouthing words and no sound was coming out. And the show had to go on, um, the, you know, there was no, it was like, yeah. they, they had to just jump in um, and they had to solve it and they did. And I would like to mention that they did win in their category, despite this incredible- wow. 
um, mishap. So well, it was congratulations. It was a really impressive moment um, right there. So we have one more student who I would like to introduce who is really wonderful at talking about um, empathy and collaboration. And I just want to make sure that we, we get to meet her because she's pretty incredible. And her name is Jessica. Jessica, would you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your experience too? Yeah, I'm Jessica. Um, but I think the Conrad Challenge was a huge part of like getting involved in the community. And um, it really made me like assess like what the market was and like who really needed the product and like who we're fighting for. It's not just we're doing these products to um, help random people. Like we got involved in the community and we really like wanted to create a sustainable product to help them. And what product were you focused on mostly? Um, so I and my team did um, the Smoke Free World India, so BD addiction. Oh, right. um, but we geared more towards the women working in the BD industry. Mm -hmm. And we created kits to help them start their own micro business. And then part of those profits will go towards rehab and those facilities. So what goes into a kit that helps a um, tobacco workers start her own business? Yeah, so we did um, like an embroidery kit, um, sewing kit, and a jewelry kit, which are really uh, popular businesses in India, um, specifically like the state that my family is from. And so we were able to kind of look at the market, see how well those businesses do. And how did you figure out um, what would, you know, I guess you, you must have had to figure out then not just that they were going to pro be producing, you know, sewing artifacts or knitting art artifacts or jewelry art artifacts, but also how they would, how they would sell and market them, right? Yeah, so um, we were looking at like places that they are and um, more of the area and just figuring out like specific locations once we specified on the region. So can you just kind of w walk us through, was there a time where you thought, gee, this isn't going to work? And then um, some things happened and then what made it work? So could you go walk us through a time like that? Yeah, um, that thought came into my mind probably every five seconds. Um, but I think what just got me through was my team like super confident um, because I'm not clearly, um, but just like promising that it's good and then really talking to the people in the community um, and having that opportunity to kind of meet people affected by it, listening to stories um, and really like through that, I was able to gain confidence in like how sustainable the product was and like hearing feedback. You do know that generally the people who are the most confident competent are the people who don't think that they are, right? There we go. I guess that's, that's me. you. <laughs> and I can assure you that Jessica is very competent. I she I can I can tell. You can tell. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that you know the idea of of failing and being willing to fail and and being willing to confront what you don't know is, is it's just so important to this challenge. And it's something that I know it sounds, you know, is super paradoxical, but these students, their willingness to, you know, be afraid, their willingness to step into the unknown and their willingness to try something and have it not work and then try something else. And then try, right. Like that's, I, I think that that's just so much the secret, um, to what they do. And it's a secret to, I think, succeeding at the Conrad Challenge is being willing um, to do that. And I don't know if any of the rest of you want to speak to that, you know, the, the feeling of being willing to fail or the feeling they are all just absolutely incredible as I can, you know, tell that you all know, but they had to really step into this world where year they're just high school students and they're solving problems you know on a different continent or they're they're just taking on these challenges that are so huge um and yet they were willing to you know do their little dance with failure in order to succeed and, and i don't know if any of you are willing to talk about what that was like for you 
I would actually love to talk about this because I feel very strongly about this. Um, I actually work for the Conrad Challenge now. So um, if you can imagine how moved I was by the work I did with Conrad. But I feel like just starting from the beginning, um, I realized we are never really taught that failure was a good thing. And at least me personally, I was taught learn from your mistakes, just don't do it again. Or um, see, just, and see I, I just don't make mistakes, so I'm okay. I wish I didn't make mistakes, right. but I do. And, and, you, I, and if you believe me, I, there's a bridge that I could sell you called the Brooklyn Bridge. Just Venmo me the cash and I'll sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. So anyhow, go ahead about the, about the mistakes. Yes. <laughs> so I was always um, someone who never really strived to fail. But the Conrad Challenge, as I started and as our first prototype didn't work or um, as something just it just didn't go right. I learned that I actually craved the feeling of failure because I ended up trying again. I ended up getting back on the bicycle um, and not just staying down on the ground, um, which is something that I think is so important for students to understand now is that it is okay to fail. And it is, it is okay when your project does not succeed or you don't get that A on the test. Like it is okay as long as you don't stop there. And the Conrad Challenge, I think, just wired all of our brains that way now to believe that we can, we can fail and keep going. And that really it is, failure, in my opinion, is vital for all of our success. So, so, I'm, about, so mm -hmm. one of the things that, you know, somebody watching this could be thinking, well, you guys are saying this because you were already set to succeed after failure. Um, but that a normal kid wouldn't be able to make the adjustment that you did. How would you count, would you counter that? Or do, they, do you think that's a valid criticism? I think that is definitely something that could cross someone's mind. But, you know, it is something that, that's a hard question because it's something you have to learn. And, anyone can learn to fail. And I think everyone knows how to fail. Um, but if a student thinks they can't do it, or they think they're going to fail from the beginning, then just something something's off because that should never cross someone's mind. You should be able to at least try. And I think all of us were very much um, encouraged to try. Not necessarily, we weren't guaranteed a win or guaranteed success. I think we just all became so passionate after failing the first time to get up and try again. Um, so it's like so, success comes to the person who just keeps on coming back even after what they tried to succeed. Exactly. And even though like, I would say we did figure out our prototype and we did eventually succeed, but we still wanted to improve. So let's say you are an athlete and you win a game. I wouldn't say you retire there. You know, you keep wanting, you keep wanting to win again and you still want to keep succeeding, but you're not gonna succeed every, succeed every time, which I think is something super important to understand. I just want to add to that because I think Izzy said that so beautifully um, and that was just that really struck a chord but I also think the other thing that was really interesting is so going into innovation class our summer homework was actually to write a failure resume and so we walked into the first day of class with a list of our failures and we put it down at a seat and we went around and read everyone else's failures. Um, and that was, that was how we started the class. So we started the class on that note of like, it's okay to fail. Every single person in this room has. And Miss Letter even gave us an example of like her failure resume over the summer. And so we started the class with that mindset of like, it's okay to fail. We didn't go in being like, you have to be successful. You can't like lose. Like we went in expecting failure. And so I feel like when we hit failure, like Izzy was saying, like it was just that much easier to 
to get back up again and keep going because we're like, oh, well, that's where we started from. So we're just back to square one, got to move, you know, got to get past this. And so so what, can- what changes then when you go into a project or you go into something and your attitude is, I'm probably going to fail the first couple of times I try this, but I'm eventually going to get that. How does that change your whole approach? I think it just goes back to what Izzy was saying. Like, it's not the actual failure part. It's the getting back up again part. And that's what changed, like your mindset towards that changes because you go in expecting the failure. So you've already told your, in your, like you told yourself in your mind, I'm going to have to get back up again. So you're prepared to get back up again. You're prepared to move in a different direction. You know, you never get your heart set on like, this has to be the way I have to do it. You know, like, okay, if that doesn't work, I'm going to try this. If this doesn't work, I'm going to try this. And you go into it knowing that the first thing isn't going to work. And the second thing probably isn't going to work. And the third thing probably isn't going to work either, but that's all going to help you get to where you want to be. And it just helps you pick yourself back up again and, and push past that. And what about feedback? How about the information you get from failure? How, how important is that? And maybe just, Jeff, oh, go yeah. ahead. I was going to say, Jeffrey hasn't talked for a while, so I thought maybe. Oh yeah, Jeffrey can go ahead. Okay, something I just wanted to add was that um, throughout this Conrad process, something I learned was that uh, I shouldn't accept failure as the final result. Like, I will keep on failing, but when I hit that roadblock, like, what am I going to do next? You know, like, even if the product in the end doesn't work, I know that I don't end on failure. I end with, with like experience of like repetition and like determination and just uh, basically uh, ending on a place where I know that if I come across another situation like this, I have a higher chance of succeeding. So yeah. it sounds like you're you're gearing up that you're going to try something and you're going to get information from whatever you try and then you're going to come up with the next thing to try how do you get into that creative mindset to be able to do that so um what i believe about creative mindsets is that it's different for everyone like uh me personally what i like to do is honestly just like close my eyes and think of something very random. And then if I can relate it to uh, a problem, then I'll try to come up with a solution. Um, Other people- So getting some (laughs) distance from the problem itself so that you can be more creative about it. Yeah, like sometimes I'm focusing too hard on like things closely related to a problem. So I wanna take a step back, maybe look at holistically or simply just look at a specific aspect of a problem that I know if I solve this, then I'm on to a next step. And then I take it step by step like that. And maybe we can go kind of around the, the group. If a, uh, if a, I guess a school or a teacher or a student were thinking, you know something, I'm thinking about the Conrad challenge, but it sounds like I'm not gonna succeed or it's gonna be too hard what would you what would you say to that person or what would you say to that that student or that teacher or that school i can go um so i think the first thing i would say is that you cannot be afraid of failure it will block your mind it will stunt the opportunities and possibilities that you can create for yourself So I definitely think that all of us going into the class were afraid of failing and did not think we were going to succeed. Um, And I think it ended up um, restricting our minds. And if you go into a project or go into just thinking about the Conrad challenge and you're thinking about entering, and if you think you can fail, what ideas and innovations are going to be in the back of your head, but you're not going to write down on a piece of paper because you're afraid it's not good enough or, oh, it's too far outside the box. It's anything like that. I think the main thing is you cannot be afraid to fail and it will change the way you think. Oh, great. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Talpasha, what would would you say to this, uh, a student or a teacher or a school? 
or did you lock? Oh, you're there. Okay, Topash, maybe you can unmute. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. What yeah, would you so, say? Um, some, some advice I would give is definitely open to all things that could possibly happen because thinking outside of the box is sometimes not preferred, but in aspects such as the Conrad challenge, being innovative is everything because innovative ideas are what, you know, change the world. And so being if I were to say to, to you, I'm sorry, as Izzy I'm, said, while if, also being open to, oh. No, but if I were to say to you, look, I'm just not a creative, I'm not an innovative person. So why should I do this? What would you say to me? Well, I don't think creativity has anything to do with it. I feel like being open to other I people's ideas and other people's creativity is also something that definitely helps because working in a team, even if you have one creative individual listening and being able to collaborate upon an idea that might just seem so strange is something that's going to help your team succeed. Fascinating. Thank you. And Jessica, what would you say? Yeah, I would just say dream big. Um, I will admit, I definitely going into this class, I was one of those people that were like, oh, like I'm not creative. I'm actually about to drop the class because I was a little scared. Um, and like my failure resume could have been like five pages long. But um, really like this class taught me anything is like never like limit yourself and always just go for it, um, which has helped me with basically every aspect of my life. And so I'm really grateful. So just shoot your shot. It never hurts. Yeah. And I, so you think that that the lessons that you learned by doing the challenge are things that are going to allow you to live a very powerful life. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And Mana, what would you um, say? Yeah. I think I would say that you can't go into the challenge with the goal of winning. I think you have to go in with the goal of helping people and you have to go in and find something you're passionate about because even if you don't win, like that passion is always going to shine through and people can always see that. We, we've seen so many pitches and we've given pitches that we haven't been passionate about. And we've seen pitches that people have been giving and that they don't, they're not passionate about. And you can tell, and you can tell when someone really does care and when they really do want to help make a difference. And I think the biggest thing is like, you can't go in being like, oh, I, I need to win. I, I'm only doing this to win. You have to go in with the mindset of like, no, I just want to help people. And if that means that I end up winning, and if that means that I get to, you know, expand this to a bigger audience and have a bigger stage to present my idea on, that's great. But like, my purpose is not that win. My purpose is my purpose is to help people. So if I'm a high school student, and I'm thinking to myself, you know something, I just want to get through high school, I want to get my B's, and then I'm going to get into college. What would you say to me? I would say, you know, I, and I feel like a lot of people do live that life. And I think my, I don't know, like my advice to that person is just like, you need to give your life a meaning and like a purpose, no matter what that is, like whatever that is for you. And like lying low and just trying to make it through and not really doing anything you're passionate about isn't going to make you happy in the long run. And it isn't going to give you that purpose that you're searching for. And so I think you need to find that purpose, whatever that might be for you. And I think I would just say like, find your purpose, find your passion and what, what you want to do and pursue that, right? You don't have to do it in like a public setting. It could be something you do on in your free time by yourself, but, but find that passion and find that purpose and, and just go after that. And it sounds to me like if I don't have that passion or that purpose to begin with, just the process of starting to go through the Conrad challenge would tend to give it to me. Yeah. It really, Allow, really help, or tend, tend to help me find it. Yeah. Okay. So Jeffrey, let's say that I'm a teacher and I'm thinking, you know, with my kids, um, I have to raise their test scores and I have to put my time into raising their test scores. And I, you know, this would be really nice, but we just don't have time for stuff like this. 
we have to increase the mass test scores, we have to increase the reading test scores. What would you say to that teacher? Um, so first thing I would say is probably that uh, test scores are not everything. Like in the application process, a lot of colleges will look at uh, all parts of your application. Okay, so I'm gonna push back a little bit, if you don't mind, or even if you do mind a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna say that the test scores aren't everything, but I as a teacher might have might be fired if my students don't score well on tests. So yes, I want them to do well. Yes, I want them to learn, but I have to get their test scores up. So why should I put the time into con having them do the Conrad challenge? Hmm. Well, uh, if, if their job is on the line, I'd say uh, <laughs> you should uh, set your priorities. Uh, if your students uh, really need to raise their test scores, then you should focus on that first. But also, uh, how great is it that uh, your students can uh, basically find a passion that they they want to uh, follow for the rest of their life, right? Which is because, probably why I went into teaching for the first place, right? Yeah. And uh, a test score, a low test score is um, not going to be super, I, I'll say like significant in somebody's life compared to, uh, let's say like, making it to the finals of the Conrad challenge where you get to like meet uh, business people and uh, Navy generals and you get to uh, discuss with other people and get advice on how to market, how to start your business, things like that. And I feel like Conrad is just, uh, just takes uh, education and like, business to a whole nother level for uh, students. Yeah, it sounds like you, like, look, you all are gonna lead really great lives. Um, I'm glad that, that people in my generation screwed things up so that you can have the, all these challenges to make the world a better place. Um, but uh, Christy, do you want to, what advice would you give to schools? that are thinking about well, the red challenge. And, and I just have to say that all of these skills that we're so worried about testing and that we're, you know, the tests are supposed to measure that in the Conrad challenge, even when they don't realize it, there's a lot of math. There's so much science. There's so much social science. There's so much consideration of the world. There's so much communication. Um, but instead of being in a vacuum, Right. I mean, you, you have an amazing session coming up about assessment, but the assessment here is not multiple choice or getting one answer correct. It's can you take these skills that school is teaching you? Can you take your research skills? Can you take your logic? Can you take right, your ability to use the scientific method and can you apply it? Can you, can you put it into context where you can see why in the world you bothered to learn it in the first place? And I think that it, it really takes the abstractions of, you know, here's how you can use a table to show, you know, these different mathematical concepts. If you take that and you talk about how you can create a self-sustaining micro business that will, you know, help a whole population, that that suddenly takes these concepts and puts them in a whole new light. And I think that it really is exactly the purpose of schools. It is exactly the assessment that we're looking for. And, you know, in my completely biased opinion, any college worth their salt would put that first and foremost to see that these students can solve those kinds of problems. Um, and it gives me faith about the world that they can. Because, yeah, me too. Uh, you know, the world is as, you know, it's it can be very, very, messed up and it is only knowing that these amazing young people are coming up to change it that you know keeps me going some days yeah me too um yeah thank you thank you all do you uh, does anybody have anything that that they wished we would have asked or they wish you could have said you didn't get a chance to say well then i just have to say you guys are fantastic whatever you do in your life 
I, I'd love to find out because my guess is you're going to change the world. So, um, you know, I feel confident. I, I did too. May, may the force be with you. So, <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you all so, so much, Christy. Thank you. And, um, I guess, uh, we'll, and, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be in touch online or, or, and hopefully the, this COVID virus ends so that we can see people in person again. That will be great. And I just really appreciate, thank you so much for really honoring these student voices because they are amazing. Yeah, it, this was this was my pleasure. I just, I, I feel honored that I got a chance to meet all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, have a, have a good evening um, and uh, I'll maybe see you online. Okay, bye.